So we've already been there once this morning. Get back to Ephesians 6. It's actually what we're going to be preaching on. I don't think Jet knew that. So praise God for orchestrating something like that. Ephesians 6 is where I want you. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's one underneath your seat or the seat next to you. I'd love for you to join us there. And if you don't own a Bible, don't leave today without one. We've got plenty of free ones for you that you can feel free to take home with you. That would be our gift to you. Ephesians chapter 6. That's New Testament, uh, kind of in the middle of it. Okay, let's get this going. Let me say this first. Life is war. Is it not? Life is war. That's not all it is, but it is always at least that. And I, I found something out in this war. Something else to be true as well. In this war, there's no regard for one's character or one's devotion and compassion. There is always danger. And the better you live, the more dangerous it gets. If you aren't a threat to the strongholds and strategies of Satan, then you aren't a target. Right? Especially if you don't even realize that there is a cosmic war going on right now. A war between light and darkness. The kingdom of God versus the forces of Satan. I mean, how many of us would say that we've been actively living with a wartime mentality in the last week? Just a few. Right? I mean, do you, do you wake up realizing that you're already behind enemy lines? Guys, for half of my Christian life, I wasn't convinced about this, right? I grew up in a kind of Christian environment that failed to speak about spiritual warfare in the heavenlies, failed to teach on it. They said, if we just don't talk about it, they didn't really actively say this, but uh, my assumption is that if, they, if we don't talk about it, then nothing's going to happen, right? It, it will, we'll be all right. They failed to even make me aware, so I wasn't convinced, and especially when I got to college and like, started getting closer with friends who were godly guys, and I trusted their character, and they started telling me stories about things that had happened in their life that I couldn't explain outside of spiritual warfare in the heavenlies, outside of demonic oppression and spirits. So at first, I, I rejected it as nonsense, saying that kind of stuff just doesn't happen at all. But eventually, over and over again, I just started having to wrestle with the reality of it. Is this real? You go to the Word and see if it's real, if it's still for today. I mean, guys, so far at that point in my life, the only, the only kind of experience that I had had with any kind of demonic or spiritual oppression was from watching the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. And I do not commend that to you. I do not say you should watch that movie. If you have that movie, I would say just get rid of it in a nice way. Okay, but, uh, and that wasn't the convincing point. That's all I had, right? So it, uh, I finally got to this place after getting after the word. I got this point to this point in my life where, where I believed that Satan was a real being who commanded spiritual forces, commanding real spiritual forces, seeking to devour my life and thwart God's plans. And, and when I got to that place theologically, Actually, I joined a very small percentage of Christians who are there as well. Statistics show, there's a, there's a Barna study that came out in 2009. Uh, uh, the study showed that only 26% of Christians believe Satan is a spiritual being, not just symbolic of evil. 26% of us as Christians believe that Satan is a real spiritual being working to thwart God's plans which means 74% don't. So just 26% of us believe that Satan's like real. And I think that statistic alone explains a lot why, why our prayer lives tend to suffer the most. Right? So today, I, I don't have time to argue 
or, or, or uh, legitimatize the belief that Satan is a spiritual being and de- demons are real. I, I, the, the, if you were to just go to scripture and read it naturally, scripture assumes all of that is real. So I don't have time to talk to you about what scripture already says is real. Um, what we do want to talk about today, though, is I want to show you how prayer plays such a vital role in spiritual warfare. Right? And so I, I, already all of you are probably thinking, man, this is pretty sobering. Like this is, ugh, this is gritty. I don't, ugh. So I'm sorry if you were expecting unicorns and rainbows this morning instead of demons and Satan. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's get after this in, in verse 10 of Ephesians 6. You should already be there. Verse 10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might. <laughs> Try to rationalize that. Be strong in the Lord and be strong in the strength of his might. Okay. All right, Paul, you already confused us. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord, right? Now, you're probably very familiar with this passage. In fact, if you have kids, they probably own the armor of God in their toy bin, right? They can go put it on right now if they wanted. So you're you're very familiar with this. There's a lot to digest here still, and I can't cover it all today. But let's let's get after this. So, So Paul commands us twice in this paragraph alone to put on the whole armor of God. If you want to, you can go and circle both commandments, right? Put on the whole armor of God. You see it in verse 11, and then you see it in verse 13, right? He tells us to put it on. Which, which, if we keep our mindset in the little toy bin, we're not going to realize that this is us walking into an armory preparing for war. Right? So put on the whole armor of God. Why? Why should we get dressed for war? Verse 11 actually says that we should dress for war in God's armor so that we can do what? So that we can stand. So we can stand against Satan's schemes, according to verse 11, and then so that we can stand uh, to withstand in the evil day, according to verse 13, so that we can stand. But why do we even need to stand if there's not a war happening, right? I mean, couldn't I just stroll through life lackadaisical and just looking at all the butterflies around? No, why would we even need to worry about standing, Well, what Paul explains, right? There is something that could make us fall. And it's in verse 12. He says that there's a spiritual war going on. Look at this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against the physical, right? But we wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So why should you and I suit up? It's because we are in a supernatural war. And you maybe didn't know that when you signed up to follow Jesus. C.S. Lewis says this, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch Every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Right? 
So, so when you, when you hear the word wrestle, right? When you, when you, uh, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the spiritual forces, right? What's the first thing that comes to mind, right? Uh, two men in leotards rolling on top of each other on a really comfortable mat inside of a circle with a referee making sure nobody gets too hurt, right? That's what comes to mind when I think of the word wrestle. That's why I never did wrestle, <laughs> right? No, the kind of wrestling happening here is actually hand-to-hand combat in a war zone where you're standing against an enemy and an enemy is standing in front of you seeking to in- like, take your life. You are engaged in hand-to-hand combat to the death. That's what wrestle means. And you're fighting against, you're wrestling against, you're warring against these unseen supernatural forces. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil. So if, you, if, you were, to, if we were to go even deeper on this, those are actually s- different strata and rankings of demonic forces in the supernatural empire in which they operate. We are warring against an incredibly evil and potent enemy. Now, now Paul doesn't really take time to clarify exactly what all this means, right? But he tells us what to do in response. And when he tells us what to do in response, he's actually telling us who we are as well. So he, he commands us as Christians to do what? We should, we should suit up for war, which means what about us? We, 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 that, that, that we're just supposed to go, go lie in our houses and just eat grapes all day and have palm branches over us? No. He's telling us that part of our identity in Christ is that we as Christians are warriors. The occupation of a Christian is war. And I know that that's politically sensitive, and I apologize, but Scripture is very clear, and I will always elevate Scripture against politics. We are warriors. We are the ones who are to war against an enemy that lurks in the world today like a lion seeking someone to devour whose aim is to kill, steal, and destroy. And not only that... But you and I also wage war against an enemy that is within, right? An enemy that lurks inside of us. It's called sin. It's the old self and we can't seem to get away from it. He he seeks to take back the throne of our lives. He once had dominion over us. Christ conquered him and now he seeks to get back on the throne within us. Spurgeon himself said that if our enemies were so far away, We could rain down artillery from on high, uh, from a safe distance, which means like a pretty easy lifestyle for us, right? If they're far away, then we don't got to do much. But no, they are here. They're at the door. They are within us. They are nearer to us than our hands and our feet. If you don't believe me, think about it for a second. Who, who, Who talks to you the most? Who, who do you think talks to you the most? You do. Right, that sounds silly. But out of everyone in your life, you are the one who speaks to you the most. You are leading yourself. You are talking to yourself. You are always in a conversation with yourself. Right? I'm even talking to myself right now. Right? Thinking of what I should or shouldn't say. By the way, this is the first sermon that Caitlin did not have to remove anything from. For either time or just censorship, right? But uh, all that to say, really random. I don't, I don't know why I went there anyways. So you, you are always talking to yourself. You are always in a conversation with yourself. No one talks to you more than you do. And you can be speaking to yourself words of life, the goodness of God, the gospel. Or you can be speaking words of loneliness, of poverty, inability, doubt, fear, pride, selfishness, idolatry, lust, envy. All even though you know better than that, right? Guys, there is an enemy in the world, and there is an enemy within you, in me. 
that both seek to destroy. And in this war, I love how Spurgeon puts it. He says, in this war, you can count on it that you, can, you will be forced to wage war in such close quarters as your heart and your mind. That's why we don't have in the list of armor the spear of justice, right? Or the bow and arrow of sanctification. <laughs> but we have the sword of the spirit. Swords are a close quarters weapon. Guys, this is hand-to-hand combat in an unseen war. And Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, if anyone thinks that he can stand in this war, you better be careful or else you're going to fall. We have to stand in this war. Guys, I, I hear the, the jokes of like, uh, the, the strongest place that you could ever be is on your knees, right? And that's talking about prayer, right? But, but in war, is that the strongest place that you could ever be? No. Where's the strongest place? What, what position is the strongest place for you to be in? Standing ready to attack. Ready to defend. Ready to retreat. Ready to advance. It's not laying down on your back. It's not crawling on your knees like a dog. No, standing is the most important position, the most strategic position for us to be when we are in war. Every part of you is ready for attack. And I say this because when we think about warfare, we think, well, what's coming against us? But Paul's not just talking about what comes against us. Paul is talking about what we stand against, what we advance after. So the the picture here is we both stand and we withstand. Meaning we're not just defensive, we're offensive, right? We're not merely to defend, but we are to attack. It isn't enough that we are conquered, but we are to conquer. So it's why we have both defensive armor and offensive weapons in our war. And in our equipment that we went into the armory to get. Guys, we must wage this war to both not be conquered, but also to conquer. So we have to slay this enemy. We have to slay Satan's attempts and we have to slay the sin that's within us. Because both have already been defeated and still are seeking to devour. Guys, I I promise you, there isn't any room for peace in this There's no room for a peace treaty, right? Jesus himself says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So do you want to stand in this war? Do you you want to be able to stand against everything that Satan wants to accomplish in your life with all of his backhanded schemes and strategies? Do you want to be able to stand when uh, the enemy within you rises up and seeks to take the throne of your life back by causing you to run rampantly into sin? Do you want to stand in all of this? Then suit up. You know, I feel like Captain America in saying that. This is the fight of our lives. But suit up. I mean, look at what we have in the armory, right? Right? Stand firm, therefore, verse 14, having fastened on the belt of truth, which holds everything together, right? And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can distinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Guys, in the armor, we have equipment, to protect and defend every vital organ in our body. Every vital organ is covered and defended and we're given a double-edged sword that is as sharp and can cut through bone and marrow. All of which Jesus Christ purchased for us in his death and resurrection. He won it for us permanently and we have to appropriate it to us daily. Guys, we are equipped for this war. We are entrusted with weapons that literally have divine power to demolish enemy bunkers and strongholds. But then check out verse 18. So he says that we have to stand in this war. Therefore, if we want to stand, then we have to suit up with all of this equipment. And in verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. 
So, so we get all of this armor from the armory. And then he says, pray at all times with all prayer and prayer, basically. Pray at all times with all kinds of prayer and prayer. So don't make a mistake here that, that, that too many teachers or individuals who read the Bible may do. And they, they put prayer as a, a, another piece of equipment that God's given us in, in Christ and in the armory. Like, like prayer is just like truth or righteousness or, or, or the rest of them, right? Because Paul does not liken prayer to anything like a helmet or a breastplate or a sword. No, he, he, he just said it's, it's an entirely different category. Prayer is so much more than that. As prayer isn't just a godly weapon. This is, this is the main point for the morning. So if you're going to be paying attention, prayer is the act of war. Prayer is you fighting the war itself. Right? Prayer is getting ready for the war. Prayer is actually getting strong for the war. When he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Prayer is where that happens. Prayer is getting sensitive enough in your soul so that you can really discern what's really going on around you in the war. Prayer is the way that God's truth is worked into our hearts to create new warlike instincts, reflexes, and dispositions. Guys, prayer is calling down fire support against a spiritual enemy who stands against you or your family or your church. Prayer is requesting for headquarters to send a bunker-busting missile into your soul to demolish Satan's stronghold of lust or pride or envy in you. Guys, prayer is the act of war. You know, I love the way John MacArthur puts it. He says it this way. Prayer is the very spiritual air that the soldier of Christ breathes. It is the all-pervasive strategy in which warfare is fought. Now, remember last week I mentioned a book by John Piper called Let the Nations Be Glad, how all of chapter two talks about prayer and mission. Uh, In that chapter, he says this about prayer as well. Let me read it to you. Prayer is a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief so that we can call headquarters for everything we need as the kingdom of Christ advances in the world. Prayer gives us the significance of frontline forces and gives God the glory of a limitless provider. Brothers and sisters, I have to say this. Until we know that life is war we cannot know what prayer is for. Until we know that life is war, we cannot truly know what prayer is for. Because you know what millions of Christians have done? I mean, most of us too. We have stopped believing that we are at war. We have stopped believing that we are in a war. There's no urgency, no watching, no vigilance, no strategic planning, just easy peace and prosperity. And what did we do with that walkie-talkie? We tried to rig it up as an intercom in our houses and workplaces and cars, not to call in firepower for conflict with a mortal enemy, but to ask for more comforts in the den. Guys, prayer is not a domestic intercom to call God in like he's a butler to bring you another pillow or hot tea. So no wonder prayer malfunctions when we try to use it that way according to James 4. Guys, prayer works best when it is used what it was designed for to get us in touch with God, our commander and chief who is in command central, ready to strategically use you and me to make war and send in divine support. So pray. Pray, pray, pray. I mean, Paul says it multiple times actually in this passage. So I'm going to keep repeating it multiple times. Just pray. 
right? Praying at all times. Look at all the different alls that he uses. There's four different ones. He says, pray with all kinds of prayer. All kinds of prayer. So public or private with loud cries or soft whispers. Planned or spontaneous. Sitting, standing, kneeling, laying down, walking at home or at church. Working or traveling with your hands folded or raised, with your eyes opened or closed, offering praise and adoration, thanksgiving or confession, making petition with specificity or in general. All kinds of prayer. And he says, pray at all times. Praying at all times. So literally, walking in continual God consciousness. In a continual wartime mentality where everything that you see and everything that you experience becomes a kind of prayer between you and God. He says, pray with all perseverance. Pray with all perseverance, earnestly, courageously, and persistently bring everything in your life before God. Just like that old lady with the judge who constantly goes before him day after day seeking justice and never ceases to relent. How much better is a heavenly father who loves you in that scenario? Pray with all perseverance. And then lastly, he says, pray for all the saints. Guys, I, 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 I don't know what better thing to do for you than to pray for you. There's literally nothing higher that I could ever do for you or we could ever do for one another than to pray one for one another. Nothing beats that at all. Because I'm saying, hey, here's my friend's life, here's my brother or sister's life. God, would you, would you do something incredible in this? There's nothing better. So pray with all kinds of prayer, pray at all times, pray with all perseverance, and pray for all the saints. So guys, I I, I don't know what better to do than to just say, I am calling you to war. Or better yet, I'm calling you to re-engage in the war. So when I tell you to pray, I am saying, go to war. Pray. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. When the urge to lie or lust rises within you, pray. When your family member is drowning in their own sin, pray. When you're totally lost and feeling all alone and directionless, pray. When you need to figure out what is going on in your life and to get some direction, pray. Pray. When you have the sense that you can't make it through the darkest night of your life, pray. When Satan seems to have surrounded you and your life is on the verge of ruin, then pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray with all alertness. Pray with all kinds of prayers. Pray all the time. Pray with all perseverance. Guys, I've been saying this from day one. When Jesus called you out and saved you. He did not call you to a life of ease and comfort. Guys, following Jesus will lead you into severe conflict with evil. Following Jesus means war. Is that not why Jesus came in the first place? The virgin birth of Jesus Christ was God establishing the beachhead on Satan's sin and death. The cross was the victory and the defeat of sin, Satan, and death, rendering them powerless. The return of Christ will be the day when he totally demolishes them, throws them into the lake of fire, and they are no more. This is war. Following Jesus means war. Evil will surround us. Suffering will ensue. Sin will try to rise up within you. And it will all work to attack you and try to destroy your faith. And all of this will 
increase more and more in your life, the harder you run after Jesus. I told you it at the beginning. I'm telling you it again. The harder you live, the more dangerous it gets. I mean, you can live your life in such a way that Satan and demons know your name. They did just like with Paul and Apollos. Paul, we know. Apollos, we, we, we've heard of. But, but who are you? Guys, I want us to live our lives in such a way that when we die, all of hell will rejoice that we've been taken out of the war. So how hard are you going to run? How much better are you going to follow Jesus? How committed to God's mission will you be? Guys, this is, this, is, this is the way out right now. If, if you want a comfortable life with no suffering, if you want comfortable life with prosperity, if you don't want to, to endure anything that may be hard, now's the day to get out of this. Don't fight to do anything of eternal significance with your life. If you want ease and comfort. The harder you live, the more dangerous it gets. Because life is war. And if you want to see God's kingdom advance and the forces of darkness retreat, if you want to see the strongholds destroyed and chains broken, then suit up and go to war. Praying again and again and again and again at all times in the spirit with all perseverance, keeping alert for all the saints. Praying This is your call to war. Pray. So right now, we've got got a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask that we do just that. Guys, when, when, when Satan gets a stronghold in your life, that, that can be something like uh, a, a repetitive sin that you just can't seem to defeat. Or when the greatest amount of suffering in your life ensues, just like it did with Job, that is the time not to run from God, but to run to God in prayer, to seek his presence, to go to your heavenly father, to go to your commander in chief and beg for him to give you grace. So what I want to do right now is I'm actually going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up. And I, I want you all to bow your heads. And, and either out loud or quiet, depending on how self-conscious you feel, my, my hope in this time would be that you guys have already, by the Spirit, identified some sort of stronghold in your life. Maybe it's fear of the future. Maybe it's the greatest amount of pain because of something or someone that you lost. And Satan has used that over and over and over and over again to totally keep you in depression, to keep you in wandering, keep you in fear, keep you away from God. Today's the day that that stronghold be broken. So I am asking you right now, would you bow your heads and would you pray for God to send a bunker-busting missile into that stronghold in your life? And then I'm going to pray for us as we're done.
Heavenly Father, you are the, the commander in chief. You are the one who sees the the battlefield. You see which one of us are bunkered down in the bunker in fear or worry, or how many of us are imprisoned in this repetitive, habitual sin that we just can't seem to break free of, chained and shackled. And you also see which ones of us are out on the field advancing into the darkness, advancing into enemy territory, seeking to take back those who have been captive for too long. God, for those who are in in chains, I pray in Jesus' name right now that those chains would be broken. For those who are bunkered down in fear, I pray, God, that their fear would be no more or better yet, rightly placed on you where they see the need to get up and go to war. Not fearful of what has been lost, but fighting to what can be gained in Christ. For our church, for our families, for ourselves, for our marriages. God, make this church that kind of place filled with saints whom the enemy fears who will rejoice when we have been taken out of this war. God, make us those kinds of Christians that go to war every day. Praying at all times, with all kinds of prayers, with all perseverance for all the saints. God, we thank you for this gift of prayer. We ask all of this in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen.